and we are recording. Welcome everyone to the CTSD webinar for April 24, 2017. I'm your host, Jeanette Dopheide. CTSC is the NSF Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, and these webinars are part of its mission to deliver high-quality, actionable guidance regarding cybersecurity to the NSF community. More information about CTSC can be found at trustedci.org. Today's topic is HIPAA and FISMA, Computing with Regulated Data, and it's presented by Susan Ramsey and Anurag Shankar. Before we begin, I have a few items to note. First, this presentation is being recorded. Second, participants are welcome to ask questions during the session using the chat box. And we will accept uh, questions after the presentation as well. And having said all that, I want to just welcome Susan and Anurag, and I will uh, hand the microphone over to Susan. Thank you, Jeanette. Uh, so good morning, everyone. Can you all hear me? Excellent. All right, so first, thank you for joining us, especially because it's Monday morning, and especially because this presentation is on the exciting world of compliance. Uh, so go ahead and and one more. So why FISMA? I think, you know, last year in particular, we had a lot of media coverage of attacks coming in. Uh, we had uh, ransomware of all types, and some of you here might have even been hit with ransomware. Uh, we had some enormous data breaches, uh, and, it, you know, for me, really in particular, um, we, we had confirmation that our ICS systems in our infrastructure can be damaged enough to actually cause explosions. Um, we had a 16-year-old take down Phoenix 911 with his iPhone and Twitter. Uh, and uh, I work at NCAR, and so closer to home for us, you know, Noah, uh, Noah sponsors a lot of our projects. And Noah is already getting a lot of criticism from political factors uh, for, um, quote, unquote, doctoring their measurements. So finding out that their ground stations had actually been compromised was... Um, was a little bit disconcerting for us there. Oh, I have a share my screen. I'll fix that. OK, thank you. Uh, so I'll tell a joke while we're doing that. So, um, so why did the IT security engineer cross the road? And of course, it's to get to the other side. And then uh, why did the IT auditor cross the road? And that is um, because that's the same thing that she did last year. OK, out of laughter. Right? So, uh, so on this slide, I just want to point this out that we, thank you. Uh, we all know compliance is not security, uh, but that security can be compliance. And, and I, uh, I know Lance isn't the first one to have said this, but I just pulled his particular wording out of, uh, out of his uh, class that he has on building a security awareness program. So just look at that. And all right, so uh, FISMA was originally the Federal Information Security Management Act of 2002. It was upgraded with the Federal Information Security Modernization Act of 2014. And part of it is because of the previous slide, the feds realized that other uh, systems, even though they were compliant, they weren't secure. And then in addition to FISMA, we also now have uh, stipulations listed in the DFARS for compliance to CUI, which is Controlled Unclassified Information. And I'll talk a bit more about that. So uh, when do these regulations actually apply? And uh, you know, I'm going to talk a lot about NSF, because I'm assuming that most of us here are um, participating somehow with NSF as uh, an awardee, um, NSF you know, uh, provides grants and funds FFRDCs. So NSF itself is an agency, as an agency, is subject to FISMA and annually assessed for its adherence to FISMA. And previous, uh, previously, NSF just required that their awardees submitted a security plan, and it expected them to abide by a risk management framework. 
So the change here is for contracts. We're seeing contracts now coming from federal agencies that require uh, FISMA, um, a FISMA adherence, and the contract itself will specify what level of FISMA they need at, oh, and or um, we're seeing uh, contracts with uh, CUI specifications. So uh, if you're looking at a contract like this, you know, who is responsible for, you know, um, uh, adhering to FISMA? And really, it's the contract holder. So if it's your organization, then anyone in the organization who has a stake in the contract is going to be responsible for, um, for bringing FISMA into the organization. And so, uh, so NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, um, it uh, was, uh, was told by the government to create guidelines for FISMA. And they, they have released 188 special publications that cover um, the expectations, the functional expectations for cybersecurity. Um, it, they cover a wide variety of topics. But the three that we're going to use in particular for FISMA are the um, NIST Risk Management Framework. This is the foundation. And these are the three guides here. And uh, you know, again, the guidelines cover more than just computer systems. You know, they cover organizational policy. Uh, they cover process. They cover things like role-based awareness and training. Uh, they cover physical controls at your data center, you know, like security cameras. So if you're new to FISMA, the best thing to do is to build a team and pull these people from all across your organization. Um, you'll want to find representatives and champions um, at your executive level, uh, you know, from your legal department, uh, contracts, HR, your physical, uh, sorry, facilities security uh, management, and then, of course, IT and your security team. And in going into accepting a contract that has FISMA stipulations in it, you know, consider the timeline that you might have in order to, uh, you know, make what might be organizational changes through, um, throughout, throughout other divisions, other departments. Um, for instance, if you have to uh, deploy an awareness and training program and you need HR to be on board with this and bake it into the onboarding uh, process that they have for people coming into the organization, it might take some time to, to make this happen. And you might need you know, media communications uh, you know, to help um, send the messaging out to the organization that things are changing. So uh, what's, what, so what, are we, what are we doing here? What are we going to do? So we're going to follow the NIST Risk Management Framework. It's six steps. It's spelled out. I'm sure a lot of you have seen this slide before. We're going to go through each step and just touch on um, you know, how we're going to think about it and then what we're going to have for our output for each step. The first step is to categorize your system. So um, you want to obtain an uh, IT asset inventory. And if you don't have one yet, you, you, you know, just create one. And this is going to be all of the components of your system. It's going to be your hardware, your software. Um, if you have no hardware and you're all doing software as a service, you know, you want to include your GitHub and your Office 365 in this. But you want a list of IT assets. And then you're going to, um, oh, one thing you want to do here is uh, create really good boundaries. Define your system boundaries here. Because the best thing to do to uh, keep down cost and complexity is to limit what you put in in um, in this list here. So whatever you can do to uh, to define how data flows into the system and data flows out of the system, but create those boundaries for that system, it's going to help you keep everything under control. And then once you have your IT assets and your data mapped, you're gonna you're gonna label it. You're gonna um, Define whether this is a high risk, a moderate risk, or a low risk to the organization if this data is compromised. And you might think of it as data or a service. For instance, if you have a DNS service and it, um, it's, it's critical availability, so that's going to be a high availability. But it, you know, it's more moderate risk if, um, if 
the integrity is compromised for, actually it's probably high risk if your integrity for DNS is compromised, but confidentiality could be low. So you're going to label, you're going to label your IT assets, data and services in terms of uh, confidentiality, integrity, and availability, and it's going to be a low risk, a moderate risk, or a high risk. And if you uh, need help with this, there is a special publication just for categorizing your data. It's NIST Special Publication 860. Um, and the output of this is going to be a FIPS 199, what, sorry, excuse me, a FIPS 199 document. You'll want to store each of these documents with revision control because you'll be updating them. And uh, there is a NIST guideline, actually there's a standard for, um, for FIPS 199 you can reference. Once you have the FIPS 199 created, then you go ahead and you're going to select the controls that you're going to use for this um, for the system. So based on defining a low, moderate, or risk, high risk baseline, which if you have a contract and you, your your federal agency has already said you're building me a FISMA moderate uh, system, then you have your baseline set for you already. You still have to do the FIPS 199. You still have to say, okay, here I'm, here's my asset inventory. Here's how I've categorized the data. But they're they're already set for you as as a moderate risk uh, system. And then in that case, um, so taking what you already know you have, you go in and you are going to select controls from either of these two publications here, NIST Special Publication 853. And I put R4 in here just because that's what we are using, but R5 is out. Uh, your federal agency might um, actually you know, specify which version of 853 they want you to use. If you have a contract specifying CUI, you'll use uh, NIST Special Publication 800171. And we refer to this as a baseline. Uh, and also at this point, if you can, try to tailor out any controls that your system doesn't need. If it doesn't make sense for what it is that you're delivering, um, see if you can negotiate. Uh, see if you can negotiate out uh, anything. This again will help you control cost and complexity. Thank you. You know why it's doing that? Am I doing something? Are you clicking right, here's staring at the top of the screen? <laughs> yeah, space bar. All right, excuse me. So uh, this is an example control. It's AC2. It's on account management. And 853 lays out very specific things on how it expects the organization to deal with uh, managing user accounts or system accounts. So the output of this step is called a FIPS 200 document. Again, you want to store it with revision control. This is going to be a description of your system and a list of controls that will be assessed later on when you want to get your ACO, which is authorization. Uh, to operate. All right. And um, document any tailoring in the FIPS 200. It's sort of like a contractual agreement with your contract holder that uh, they, they agree that you don't have to have specific controls in, this, um, in your system. And then all these controls get copied into a system security plan. And that system security plan is what you build out with uh, a really you know, in-depth in description of uh, your policies, standards, procedures, uh, roles, and overlays are a set of these that you can kind of reuse through your environment. Hmm. All right, we'll just get to that. So it's a it's a really good idea to go into this defining your roles and responsibilities. Uh, one thing that we ran into in, um, in our last audit is that we had it documented in our SSP, in our 365-page SSP, that our CIO, no, that our, our SSP is updated annually. But what we got dinged on is that we didn't specifically say our CIO updates the SSP annually. So if FISMA really wants to look for who does what when, and ownership and accountability are um, really just main points of uh, FISMA. You want to document in your SSP who does what when. All right, and then um, you may have you may have more plans that you are required to actually put together and publish and have signed in a formal way. Uh, if you if you have quite a bit of uh, documentation that you're going to have to do, um, we did in fact. So you might want to bring in a 
the contract tech writer, we, we brought in three. So. Um, and then step four, of course, is assess. So if you're doing CISMA moderate or higher, you'll have a requirement for an independent assessor to come in and do your audit. Uh, if, you're, if you're doing your own um, internal work, you might not have to have an external assessment, but um, you will be expected to assess your own environment. So you can, you can use uh, this special publication, 853A, to go through and do this assessment internally. And if you're, if you're having an independent assessor come in, then it's a, a good, um, good practice just to go through those questions with your team, practice for the audit. And uh, recommendations for bringing in an auditor, an independent assessor, is find a company that's familiar with FISMA. Uh, a lot of assessment companies are more familiar with PCI, uh, so they might be a little confused about some of the uh, specific requirements for FISMA. And you might ask your AO, your authorizing official, if they have recommendations for a FISMA assessment team. And uh, uh, when they come in, they're going to put together a security assessment plan. Uh, you just read through it first, make sure it sounds right, make sure that's really what you want them to do. And uh, when, when they're done, they're going to give you a security assessment report. Uh, and, uh, you know, feel free to negotiate your findings in that security assessment report. If you think you've done something right and uh, they, uh, they, they've cited you for a finding, you know, just go ahead and, and you know, state your case again. Uh, all the findings are going to get put into documents called Plan of Action and Milestones. Uh, you'll, um, so these plan of action milestones, like little mini projects, uh, you'll want to create a repository for them, and your contract holder might require that you have something like a portal where they log in and get updates on um, your progress that you've made towards uh, implementing correct security controls for the findings that they that they've cited. So uh, turn these into smart goals. Uh, make sure that you uh, that you you give yourself as much as you can the chance to to make progress on these in a way for your timeline and your organization, so that you're showing progress towards success here. And you might have to coordinate your poems cross team, like with HR contracts or uh, facilities management. So wherever your repository is, you might think of putting it in a way that everybody can log in and get updates and uh, put in status reports. So step five, almost, almost there. This is where we, we're authorized. We get an authorization to operate. Uh, even if you are only doing an internal assessment, there's still an expectation that a human being with a name and a position signs off on the risk, accepts the risk for putting this system into production. And that's kind of, a, a, again, um, back to ownership and accountability. Uh, you'll get an ATO. And uh, it might be more or less formal, but uh, there, just to point out, um, there are no criminal penalties you know, for violating FISMA. Your ATO, however, however could be uh, revoked or allowed to expire. And in a, in, in a contract situation, you may end up with um, like a breach of contract. I don't know how bad they'd get. All right. So, the last step is kind of a joke because it never ends, and this is kind of the most. This is kind of the most important step here. This is uh, monitoring. So, uh, monitoring is um, now becoming its own. It, you know, it's kind of its own subset of uh, of uh, NIST functions, and and of course, this is where the security really really happens. But the the monitor step for NIST covers organization policy and updates, business processes and updates. It is, of course, updating your poems on a regular schedule. And then, and then it's all of your information security controls. There's a guide on continuous monitoring that NIST publishes. It's NIST Special Publication 800-137. And then there's a lot of other materials out there on continuous monitoring. A lot of security programs are based all around continuous monitoring. So it's a lot of who does what when, again. Uh, we found at NCAR that tools that you might want to put in at the technology layer can be really expensive. 
So um, if you can leverage existing IT security team tools, even not just IT security team tools, but operations teams tools, like if they're running something that, you know, like something called Nagios that's uh, gathering uh, event information, then, you know, see if you can work with what you already have in place. And of course, uh, metrics collection is a big part of this. If your IT team or other teams are already collecting metrics, then see if you can um, leverage what already exists here. And then, of course, uh, as referenced in the very beginning, um, the feds were finding out that you know their systems were were being stood up with FISMA compliance, but they still were getting uh, compromised. So there was a lot of um, you know, research done, and then they found that people were monitoring compromises, but they weren't fixing anything, right? They're just monitoring these compromised systems. So, uh, so DHS is now managing FISMA, and DHS emphasis is on something called CDM, continuous diagnostics and or CDR, continuous diagnostics and remediation. And NIST has put out a new cybersecurity framework. So I think we'll be seeing more emphasis on these changes in the next few years. And there will be changes to reporting that's expected. And your, your contract holder might expect you to report in terms of um, how NSF has to report in. So um, basically, you're going to be doing a scorecard. The cybersecurity framework is more action-oriented or outcome-oriented. You know, it is proving that you're doing the, the tasks that are required to keep this um, system safe. And uh, so, I mean, in the beginning, you know, I, I was like, well, do we do RMF or do we do cybersecurity framework? And really, the RMF is, uh, is about figuring out what your risk is and then what controls you need and how you're going to make it safe. And then the cybersecurity framework is about keeping it safe, scoring yourself on how you're keeping it safe and improving as you're going along. Uh, and why? The why of that is because, you know, in 2004, it took an average of 20 minutes to compromise an unpatched Windows XP box. And things got better, right? But now Mandian is still reporting that uh, these, you know, on, an, on average, uh, infections or compromises or APTs, advanced persistent threats are existing on systems for 200 days before they're detected. And the worst part about that is that um, oftentimes the person who reports this is an outside, it's an outside entity. So for instance, like Brian Krebs, if you've never read his blog post, um, I think it's briankrebs.com, he will, he will often uh, notify companies when he's noticed that, <laughs> that they've been breached. So uh, anyway, uh, yeah. And again, uh, FISMA, for those of you familiar with ITO or COBE or one of the European management frameworks, this is a management framework. It, um, it should be really familiar. It is complex, but totally doable. Best way to approach it, if you're going to be taking ongoing contracts, is to establish a program, uh, get yourself a really good team together, get buy-in, get your executive sponsor, and then um, you know, make sure that you leverage existing organizational resources. So with that, uh, Anurag is going to now share uh, how he's done all that with IU for HIPAA. Thank you, Susan. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, can you guys hear me okay? All right. Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, looks like everything seems to be working here. <clears throat> so as you just heard, FISMA is clearly and non-trivial. Uh, it's prescriptive and there is an ATO process. Someone, the agency actually tells you uh, that you are good. <clears throat> and so let me now tell you about HIPAA, which has neither. So I'll start with uh, a little bit of a description of HIPAA. If you haven't dealt with it before, uh, it's usually uh, when I talk to people, they have a uh, questions which uh, I thought I would cover before I got into how we are handling it. With HIPAA, um, I, before I knew how to spell it, um, 
I thought HIPAA was something about health information protection, something, something. But it turns out that that is not the case. It's uh, Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. And it really is about insurance portability, your ability to take your insurance with you when you change jobs. And privacy is a big part of it. So HIPAA is, has, it's comprised of three different distinct parts. One is the HIPAA privacy rule, one is the security rule, and <clears throat> the third is the breach notification. God forbid if you have one of those breaches. The privacy rule is about uh, who the HIPAA, who the regulation applies to, uh, what is protected. It's called protected health information, or PHI. And I'm sure those of you who have dealt with uh, HIPAA know PHI intimately. <clears throat> and it covers disclosure. The security rule is actually a, a smaller part of HIPAA in some sense. And it focuses exclusively, exclusively on how you protect electronically protected health information, the ePHI. The protected health information essentially is defined as identifiable patient data with one or more of 18 identifiers. And you can look them up. Um, and somehow the space bar is not forwarding my presentation. So, so HIPAA security rule uh, is what most of us as IT providers have to worry about. There's some things in privacy rule that you should know, but this is basically, this is, is the job that we have to do, which is basically to protect health information through administrative, physical, and technical controls or safeguards, I guess in HIPAA parlance. And just like you heard in Susan's talk, it's all about confidentiality, integrity, and availability, the CIA triad, as we call it, um, to protect EPHI. And a couple of terms in HIPAA that you will always hear is EPHI created, received, maintained, or transmitted. These are the four different um, <clears throat> activities that uh, uh, basically you have to protect. Uh, HIPAA is enforced by the Office for Civil Rights within the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, so let me see. Okay, now it's working. So who is covered by HIPAA? This is something that uh, there's some misunderstanding about, the, about this. There's only two types of organizations that are covered by HIPAA. One is called covered entity, which, which of course makes sense. It's covered by HIPAA. But it's only three types of organizations, a healthcare provider, a health plan, or a health clearing house. So it, it's, it's no one outside of that. You have to go on one of those three. You can also be a business associate, which means you're an external entity to those three that serves a uh, covered entity and, again, creates, receives, maintains, or transmits uh, protected health information. Uh, if you are a business associate, you are required by HIPAA to have a HIPAA business associate agreement with the covered entity. So um, if you're NSF, again, assuming you are all uh, mostly connected within NSF grants and contracts, so why should we worry about HIPAA, which is mostly an NIH thing? Well, I mean, NSF has human subjects research, uh, lots of disciplines which is subject to something called the common rule, which was established in 1981 and addresses the ethics of government-funded human subjects research through, the govern through governance, uh, through uh, institutional review boards, IRBs. But HIPAA comes into play in an NSF-funded NSF project when uh, you engage in activity that involves identifiable health data, and this is sort of, it comes in sort of sideways if you're an engineering project, for example, testing some sort of a sensor um, for, uh, in this case, for example, for diabetes control, there can be lots of different uh, situations like this. The other thing that's happening a lot is the health data is leaking into NSF facilities, especially the HPC centers. Uh, this was something that, that we saw here locally. And often this is happening without uh, people's knowledge, which is, which is not good. So uh, is health data a target? Susan talked about some of those scary things. 
and let me let me tell you something really scary. Uh, it is very much a target. In fact, it's the most lucrative target right now. Healthcare was the second most heavily targeted sector in terms of breaches in 2016. You've probably all heard about Anthem breach. And the reason is because a health record is a, essentially a very nicely prepackaged, exploitable bundle of data. It's, it has things like demographics, government ID numbers, bank and credit card numbers, insurance plan credentials, disease statuses, and, and all kinds of things, uh, which can be used for identity theft, financial fraud, prescription fraud, obtaining medical services, or reselling the data. Um, the physical characteristics could be misused to obtain passport, visas, and, and other sorts of things. So uh, it, it is, uh, it, it's actually quite lucrative. And talking about black market, uh, I don't know if any of you have actually gone on to look at the dark web, which uh, uh, is that part of the web, <clears throat> which is sort of below the, uh, the, 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 the web that we know about is the surface web. And, and it is said that, that 10 times that um, is below the water level, so to speak, as in like an iceberg, which is the dark web, and you can't get to it without using Tor or something and uh, dot onion addresses. But if you go there, you can find all kinds of things. You can find credit card numbers, health records. Um, uh, this is actually a screenshot of a of a dark website that's selling, let's see, nine million three hundred thousand patient records from the U.S. <clears throat> for 750 bitcoins, which I think is about a million dollars. But you can go in there and choose and pick and choose a small number of records. Uh, typically, the records are selling for about hundred dollars a pop. But again, you can you can uh, divide that and, and pick and choose. Uh, if you were to go to black market, you can actually get a lot more than that drugs and you can buy assassinations and so forth. Uh, it was really quite scary. <clears throat> So the problem with HIPAA, unlike FISMA, which is prescriptive, as you've seen, is not prescriptive. It basically gives you a, a set of guidelines and you have to interpret it yourself. Uh, which again, if you have been doing HIPAA, you've sort of figured this out, but if you're, if you're starting, this is rather frustrating because you don't know exactly what is expected of you. Uh, there is no checklists or anything like that. And usually it requires some sort of uh, in-house compliance expertise, which uh, certainly most of the NSF type facilities do not have. You can hire commercial consultants, but they are very expensive and, and often there's not the budget to do, to do that. Um, there were, at least when we started, there were almost no peers at all. There are more, I mean, I'm gonna tell you about it. So I'm one of those peers, but because peers are not always easy to find, people who get into it initially actually react, you know, with fear and and take drastic and unneeded action. So the thing to remember in case of HIPAA is that it's asking you to maintain reasonable and appropriate safeguards. It's a key. It's a key thing to keep in mind. This other confusion people have is all health data electronic protected health information, and it is not. So only data, which is again, created, received, maintained, and transmitted by the covered entities or by business associates for covered entities is bound by HIPAA. So if you were to go stand out uh, out on the street and, and start reading your your health record to the masses, that is not covered by HIPAA. Or if you, if you put your health information on Facebook, that is not covered by HIPAA. However, if, in hosp if a hospital were to do that, or a nurse at the hospital were to start talking about you on Facebook, that is a violation of HIPAA. So this is something that a lot of people are not, not clear about. Also, you can, uh, there is proper ways of de-identifying protected health information, in which case it becomes non-EPHI is not subject to HIPAA. And there are a few other contexts in which uh, HIPAA identifiable and identifiable health data is not subject to HIPAA. Uh, for example, student health data, which is actually subject to FERPA, not HIPAA. So, how do you tell uh, that you are compliant? <laughs> Unfortunately, that you don't. 
um, the HIPAA compliance is non-deterministic because there's no one to, to tell you that. Uh, you may have some local compliance people that and a process that may do that, but often uh, that is not the case. So all you can do is due diligence, but the Office for Civil Rights may still find you lacking in the case you have a breach and uh, you have not interpreted HIPAA correctly. Also, no one can certify you HIPAA compliant in, uh, because no one has been authorized to certify a compliance, including HHS, who uh, <clears throat> it's often said the only way to know that you're HIPAA compliant is to actually have a, an audit, which is not something, that's not the way that you want to, to have HIPAA certification. <clears throat> of course, you don't get a certification. Also, um, HIPAA, as FISMA required, requires risk management, however you want to do it. Once it starts, it basically becomes an ongoing activity as long as there's protected health information on the system. <clears throat> so um, having tell you a little bit about HIPAA, let's, let's go into how we did it at Indiana University. Basically, we, we were one of the early people that implemented HIPAA, primarily because we were forced into it. So it's been almost 10 years that we've been doing this for central IT. So obviously our School of Medicine has been doing it for, for a very long time, but uh, central IT, including our research computing, uh, did not know anything about HIPAA. As I said, we didn't know how to spell it back in 2008. So what we did was we developed a HIPAA specific process, something that addressed HIPAA only. But as time went on, it became clear there were going to be uh, other regulations that were looming on the horizon, such as FISMA. There were some contracts that came in. Unfortunately, we were able to negotiate FISMA out of them, but that is not something that's a given as time goes on. I think, I think more and more uh, um, requirements are going to be imposed upon us. So it became clear that we could not do a HIPAA specific thing. We had to generalize it. <clears throat> So uh, risk management, uh, again, you, you can do risk management however you like in HIPAA. You don't have to use any particular kind of risk management. Uh, but it's nice to actually have a risk management framework in place. Uh, obviously, if you have done FISMA, you have basically done HIPAA as well. There are certain things that you have to do in addition to that. But uh, most have not done FISMA, so they're doing HIPAA for the first time. So you can, you can take a system or two and just basically have some safeguards in place and you do it that way. But, but we, because we had large number of systems and, and more coming with PHI on it, we needed to do it more holistically. So we went to for a risk management framework, which as Susan said, it's, it's basically something that addresses risk more holistically. It's an institutional framework. <clears throat> And uh, one of the most comprehensive one is, is the NIST RMF, as, as Susan talked about. So for us, it was clear that we were going to choose NIST. There are other risk management frameworks, such as FAIR, Octave, ISO. You can look them up. But NIST was a natural choice because, well, first of all, it, it's a standard. Uh, our homegrown process that we had was not standards based. It was based on certain, you know, some cybersecurity best practices that we kind of you know, copied and pasted from various places, but this is a known standard. And, and yet it can be tailored easily. It can address both HIPAA and FISMA and actually other uh, federal state regulations and say a word about that. And it's ideal for government funded institution, institutions because it is a federal standard. <clears throat> So uh, our current approach, basically, as Susan said, uh, uh, compliance is not necessarily security, is that we will do security first by managing risk, and compliance basically falls out of it. So what we have done is to establish a NIST risk management, NIST-based risk management framework. So we took the NIST RMF and essentially customized it for, for, for our purposes. Then you can basically do a HIPAA to NIST mapping because NIST is very comprehensive and this mapping has already been done by the government in, 
the NIST Special Publication 800-66. But there are certain controls in NIST that uh, in HIPAA that do not map to NIST, so we of course explicitly address those. And our approach was different in some sense that we had focused. We decided to focus on minimizing risk for any particular situation rather than creating a completely separate walled garden just to do HIPAA, which especially on our big supercomputing system was simply not a practical uh, option. Uh, these things cost millions of dollars. And as I said, HIPAA says thou shalt manage risk, not that you will necessarily build a walled garden. Um, so establishing RMF, what does that mean? It basically for us meant that we inventory and document existing policies and procedures. And these are mostly institutional policies and procedures <clears throat> and also controls which are common to the institution. So, <clears throat> and <clears throat> excuse me, by which I meant, I mean, uh, uh, technical controls such as Active Directory and, and so forth that will apply to every single system. And in, in our case, these are central systems, so they do apply to every system. <clears throat> then you develop a risk management process for individual systems. And once you have a risk management framework, basically the new systems that you need to, uh, to do compliance for simply join the existing RMF. And by doing so, they expand it so that subsequent systems and projects, when you do the documentation for them, you simply point to point to them. So, for example, for instance, if you were to do uh, to do Active Directory and take that through this process, then any system that comes afterward, we simply point to AD as, as a dependency. <clears throat> so, the process that we developed this was something like this: we inventory, essentially, we we figure out what it is that we needed to protect. Um, do a risk assessment, uh, see where the gaps are, where what needs to be protected, um, respond to the risks, do training, have some oversight, and then essentially continue ongoing uh, risk management. So I'll go through this very quickly. Uh, inventory, and you'll see the differences from the uh, from the FISMA uh, land, so to speak. Uh, we have customized it for our purposes. And so we have an inventory, which is a system inventory. It has system details and location security settings, such as firewall settings, and whether we have business associate agreements in place, uh, things of that nature, software inventory. We have an access inventory, who has privileged access to, um, to user data, for example, incident logs. <clears throat> but we also do a current controls inventory. <clears throat> so that means that unlike FISMA, where you are choosing controls from the from a catalog, we actually do an inventory of controls to see essentially where the problems are. And this kind of evolved over time because when you sit down and do this, uh, the risks sort of kind of fall out as you're doing this. So all this uh, gets in a, documented in a system security plan. Uh, essentially, I decided that we would use a FISMA structure uh, so that we can use it for FISMA when, when we get to that. And it uses those same NIST uh, 800-53 controls. So uh, Susan talked about it a little bit, uh, but uh, what is NIST 800-53? A lot of people say it's, it's the standard. It is not the standard. It's just a catalog of very large number of security and privacy controls, which are divided into 17 control families, such as access control, et cetera. Uh, it defines security baselines, low, moderate, and high. And Susan again mentioned that. And basically, these baselines uh, uh, are lists of controls, and the number of controls increases as you go to work from low to high. And we use this, it really is a kind of a scary looking thing, but we use it mostly to, to make sure that we are complete in what we're doing is that we are not overlooking any control. This basically this control catalog is is every control known to man. And for those those of you, just, just to give you a uh, <clears throat> something, uh, uh, some motivation, uh, go see if you uh, can find or maybe some of you know what a detonation chamber is. There were controls in NIST 800-53 that I, after 25 years of Unix system administration, had never heard of. 
So it is highly educational and highly recommended for any sysadmin. <clears throat> this is uh, just to put a uh, uh, just a picture of our system security plan. I don't know if you can see it very well, but we colored these controls which map to HIPAA through the NIST 800-66. And so, it, you know, there's purpose and categorization and so forth. And then here's all the controls which are in place. We do an internal risk assessment. And basically the risk assessment is, is, is uh, where we all sit down and, and, and do the control inventory. And as we are doing the control inventory, we are realizing mostly the people who own the system, oops, uh, really we should be doing that because we had never even thought of such a control. So we, this results in a risk assessment report. Uh, the way we do risks is uh, the risks basically are system risk, user risk, governance risk. And the total risk is some of all of these three. And you can read that. I mean, system is more technical sort of system level risks. User is how the user is using the system. And governance is whether we have all the policies that sort of are in place. What we have done is to add workflow risk because we realize that just securing a system at the back end is simply not enough. Um, HIPAA, when you have a breach, it affects the entire institution, not just a user or a department or a system. So you have to have a holistic end-to-end -end security. And so uh, what we have done is because every use case, every workflow cannot be uh, accounted for is to uh, essentially come up with a list of representative use cases and workflows. And it really helps the users to, uh, to, to guide users thinking because they are really wanting to do the right thing, but you have to tell them uh, how to do it or to give them the tools with which to do it with. So here's just an example of here's use cases we have done for our uh, case. These are very common for all uh, in, in all research um, uh, computing settings. And then, on the right-hand side are the solutions, our local solutions. Uh, you know, so just wanted to put that up. A risk response, um, again, plan of action milestones, which basically says whether we're going to accept the risk, transfer the risk, address the risk. I guess it's going to be mitigated. You know, when we're going to mitigate it, and so forth, or, and reasons for accepting uh, risk. For example, that we just simply don't have the money to deal with. So we're trying to do this, but we just don't have the money. Training, we have training. Basically, we every person has to take uh, three training modules, the compliance training, there's an IU university training, then I've developed a training which is specific to our central IT, and also human subjects training. This is all documented. User training, again, is through the usual channels, uh, knowledge base, videos, um, media in-person classes, and so forth. We make very sure that users understand that just because the system is HIPAA compliant doesn't mean that that IU is HIPAA compliant, that they have to do their part and make sure that their end is, is compliant, their workflow is compliant. And we provide them help and give them training. So we don't just tell them, you know, go make, make your system compliant. Oversight is, is essentially a FYI. As I said, it's, it's mostly, uh, it's mostly a uh, self-asserted uh, compliance. Uh, so we sent all the documents in this compliance package to our security office, our privacy and HIPAA privacy and security officer, officers, which is actually required by HIPAA. You must have those in place. And also our internal audit. Uh, we are, this is slowly changing. We have getting more resources, so we'll, we're gonna do this more. And then ongoing risk management, again, is we have semi-annual reviews, uh, monitoring of systems, training oversight, and. Sometimes, once in a while, we have external assessments, but these are expensive, so we don't do them very often. Uh, having said all this, uh, the problem is that a lot of money has been thrown at security, and it's not really uh, reducing the number of breaches. So, so I work at the Center for Applied Cyber Security Research, and we look at other uh, trends and so forth. So there's a new trend called resilience, which basically says, uh, which accepts reality that, that we're going to have breaches. And so let's use uh, the same uh, breaches such as you know, like disease. And so use the same approach, which is that we focus on prevention, detection, response, and recovery. It's also the same sort of approach in the cybersecurity framework. And so uh, we're sort of moving in that direction. 
Um, so the outcomes, the RMF has allowed us to establish a unified approach to compliance because we do this once and we can uh, basically, uh, once we have these, this documentation, and we can do any kind of uh, compliance. Um, we're ready for FISMA. We haven't really done this yet, uh, done it yet. Units like this process, uh, all the campuses sending customers and dollars our way, and we're basically confident in our ability to handle audits. So HIPAA is entirely doable. That's the, the essence of all of this, because in most in most cases you have safeguards in place. They may not be documented, and you may not be doing a, a explicit risk management. So you just need a risk management structure and documentation, and that's a one-time heavy lift exercise. And then ongoing is really quite a lot easier to do. And again, having an RMF is useful because you're managing cyber risk holistically, and all this thing to keep in mind is the government does not expect you to undertake Herculean tasks or to build walled gardens. They want you to manage risk according to the means that you have. So uh, with that, I will conclude. I believe that's my last slide. So thank you. And uh, I think we'll take some questions. Yeah, let's, um, let's take some questions, uh, participants. Here. You're welcome to type questions into the uh, chat. Um, while, while people are typing, I want to mention a couple of things. First, uh, we have a survey that we uh, CTSC uh, uses to uh, collect some feedback on the presentation and ideas for future topics or presenters or offers to present if you are interested in presenting. So please uh, go to the, the Google link I have up here and uh, give us some feedback. And um, our next, I want to mention, uh, our next presentation, I've got it here on the screen, is going to be May 22nd at 11 a.m. Eastern. And the topic is Cybersecurity Research Transi Transition to Practice. Our speakers are Emily Nichols and Alec Yassensack. And one more thing I want to mention while I have your, your uh, eyeballs is uh, I posted here Susan's email and Anurag's. So if you guys have more specific questions for them, uh, you can contact them after this presentation. And also, I wanted to mention that the NSF Cybersecurity Summit is coming up. And it's going to be this August uh, 15th through 17th in Arlington, Virginia. And you can go to this link here to find out more details about um, the summit and the call for, t for participation, et cetera. OK, so let's hop over to uh, Christopher's question. Are you signing uh, 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 research data that make you fall under HIPAA? Jeanette, I'm, I think I'm just going to read these questions going way back up at 11.44. And, um, okay. So uh, Jaime is asking, does data at rest needs to be, need to be encrypted? Um, I didn't mention it in the presentation, but HIPAA has two kinds of safeguards. One is required, and the other one is addressable safeguards. So required safeguards, obviously, you must have in place. The addressable safeguards are safeguards that you really should have in place. Uh, and, and But if you don't have that in, them in place, then you have to explain why you don't have them in place or to address those uh, safeguards in, in some other way. So encryption is considered an addressable safeguard in HIPAA. Um, having said that, uh, it, it is hard these days to uh, justify not having encryption in place. So strictly speaking, HIPAA doesn't require that data at rest be encrypted, but it is, it is an excellent uh, control to have in place because HIPAA also has something called safe harbor. So uh, I talk about breach notification. If you have a breach, uh, if you even suspect that uh, EPHI has been, uh, has been exposed, then you have to notify the government. If it's more than 500 patient records, you have to notify local newspapers and all that. But if you have, if you can show the data was encrypted at rest and the keys were not stored with the data, then you do not have to actually report, do the breach notification. So that's a very strong uh, reason to do that. So the next question is, at IU, standard HPC users share resources with HIPAA users. Uh, did I understand it correctly? Yes, this is this is exactly correct. Uh, we are building some enclaves, but the hardware uh, 
and basically is the same. As I said, we manage risks. So we, for example, for, for these users, we would uh, look at their entire workflow and make sure that the exposures are minimized and document them rather than create a completely separate thing. And the reason is because when you start doing risk management, you realize that building a walled garden does not necessarily uh, address all the risks. I mean, for example, phishing. I mean, so you have someone's legit credentials. It doesn't matter how many, how much, how many walls you have. So, it really, risk management is is requires thinking, and and we we are reasonably convinced that we are doing our risk management. We don't need a walled garden. Um, okay, so Eli, if HIPAA covers organizations that create, receive, maintain, or transmit PHI, does IU transmit PHI? Uh, yes, I mean, transmit just means that the PHI is flowing over the network. Uh, it flows all over our networks, and it it flows hopefully completely encrypted. And so that's how it's handled. Uh, is we when we give people solutions, for example, if you saw that uh, list of workflows, then we we ensure that that all channels are encrypted, um, and and basically, I mean, we, we can't control every single user, but if uh, at least the central solutions we provide uh, are all encrypted in transit. What tools are used? Are the DTNs behind firewalls or are they in separate science DMZ for HIPAA systems? You know, they are not behind firewalls, uh, not, a, not a parameter firewall. They, are, they have host firewalls. And... Uh, and again, they, we, we feel that's uh, adequate. The government does not accept Herculean measure. That's fine. But the courts will ultimately decide whether an organization. Uh, not really the courts. I mean, the OCR comes. At, this is stuff that doesn't go to a court. The OCR comes and does an audit. And they may, uh, they may decide that, that, that you simply are completely uh, ignoring the, uh, your risk management duties and uh, they will impose a a penalty a, a, a essentially a civil penalty of course if a particular individual is doing something that uh, that they shouldn't be doing as in selling information uh, they can be liable uh, criminally but uh, that's pretty much the the that that's the the scope of of what you have what you are going to be uh, exposed to uh, cloud providers, yeah, I think I'll let Susan also answer that. Uh, we are using Box, and we have we allow PHI in our Box instance. We have an enterprise instance of Box, uh, which uh, essentially we uh, Box, as part of doing our due diligence, we did a, an extensive uh, assessment of Box, their security, and. We used something called the HIPAA Security Rule Toolkit, which is something you can download from NIST. It asks about a thousand questions about whether you know you're doing such and such. Uh, make sure you're HIPAA compliant. So we we had them do that, and then we put in a bunch of local controls. So so the concern was not so much at the box end, but at, at our local end, how that was to be used. So we had some local policies and procedures. And for example, uh, those box accounts had to be institutionally owned, uh, et cetera, of course. And we had to have a business associate agreement with box. Um, so if you basically, if you allow PHI on any cloud service, you must have a business associate agreement. And uh, uh, there are many of them, many vendors who will sign a business associate agreement. This was not the case a few years ago. Now Microsoft, Google, all the big ones will sign the business associate agreement. But again, uh, uh, when you say they are HIPAA compliant, really all that means is they have the security controls that HIPAA requires in place. But really, you are the one that that the onus is on you to make sure your PHI is protected. So you have to have all the stuff at your end um, and users end, for example. <clears throat> Susan, you have anything to say about that? <clears throat> Susan, are you? I think you're mute. Yeah. 
I don't hear Sorry about Susan. that. I double muted. I think you can hear me now, right? Yep. yep. So Eli's uh, Eli's point is excellent in that you know, the government, neither of these uh, these regulations is completely explicit about what they expect. There's a lot of room for interpretation, and that's where a lot of people end up with problems because you know we as technical people, I'm a security engineer, we often get stuck with implementing this stuff. And we're like, well, what tool do we use? And the tools aren't, you know, they're not spelled out in these regulations. And we have to go back and say, okay, well, how, how much money do we have? What's the risk to the organization? What's our organization's risk tolerance? And then when you're dealing with cloud, we're basically going to be transferring the accountability to the cloud vendor. So you want to make sure the cloud vendor knows this. And if you can write up an agreement, a business agreement with your cloud vendor, that spells out that they have breach insurance, they take responsibility for the following things, they have uh, an ISO 27001 or 2, or um, a, you know, they have SOC 2 audit reports that they'll share with you. Um, what else? I know, uh, if they have a PCI you know, audit, I think I already said that. Whatever they have for proof that they're taking this seriously, we take and store it because if we then get a lawsuit against us, we'll have proof that our cloud vendor um, did state that um, you know, that they take the burden of responsibility on them. Correct, and 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 so all Susan said is it's correct. When we did box assessment, basically we we made sure that they have these things in place. Also, the the agreement itself had these terms in uh, the business associate agreement had the terms in about notification, etc. In HIPAA, if there's a if the business associate has a breach, then they have to notify the C, the covered entity. Um, very, you know, uh, there has to be certain expectations that goes in, into the business associate agreement. Uh, talking about again uh, the implementation of these regulations, we as technical people uh, have a very technical focus, and that's not what these regulations are really looking for. Um, they're they're looking for risk management, and that that's a something I have to explain to people. Uh, because technical people don't quite get that is, is, for example, you may have a risk and you are thinking about firewalls and stuff, really you can manage that risk by simply having a policy and a procedure. That's something that I have to admit that when I was not doing this stuff and, and thinking about HIPAA, I always tried to solve some problem using a technical control and that is completely unnecessary. Uh, you can you can simply have a, a procedure. You can have a policy, well, thou shalt not do this. Um, and that would be perfectly fine. Um, OK, so then there is another question. Uh, are you requiring your users to use MFA to access the HIPAA box data? Um, I don't believe that we're doing it yet, but we are slowly moving toward um, uh, toward uh, two-factor authentication using Duo, and so, um, and I just, yeah, I, I just can't remember because <laughs> they're they're turning it on for certain things. They have turned on Duo for for almost all of the enterprise systems, you know, especially financial data because we have some paychecks that got diverted to uh, Nigeria, I think. Um, so uh, if we don't have it, we're going to have it very, very, very soon. Like uh, Christopher's Let's take a typing. Let's last call for questions. Yeah, while Christopher is finishing typing, uh, last call for questions, please. Uh, are you requiring end users to access the HIPAA box um, to, from a trusted workstation? Uh, we don't go out and ensure that they have a trusted workstation. Uh, essentially, our institutional policies say that that you will secure your machine from where you. Have, from which you are accessing data. And, and when we engage with a user, if they happen to come to us, remember we're central IT, so, so, so we don't know how users are using our services. We don't get every single user. And so when we do engage with certain users, we make sure that we train them about how to secure their systems. But, but no, not, we don't require every single user and we're not going out policing these things. Uh, 
All right. Uh, he says, are you considered failing oh, okay. under HIPAA due to the fact that you are signing BA agreements? Are you considered as failing under HIPAA due to the fact that you are signing a BA agreement to obtain, obtain your research data? Um, yeah, I don't, not quite. You are right, failing. I'm not falling. exactly. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, I misspoke. It was falling, falling under HIPAA. Sorry. Are you considered as falling under HIPAA due to the fact that you're signing a BA agreement to obtain your research data? Um, obtain your research data. Again, I'm not sure exactly what you're referring to. Um, but yes, if you, if, if we obtain or uh, one of our researchers is obtaining research data from an external covered entity, then yes, IU will sign a business associate, or they will require IU to sign a business associate agreement with them. I'm not sure if that's what you were asking, Christopher. Uh, Okay. Um, well, while he's typing, um, I think I think we've uh, we've gone over uh, a little bit, and uh, we've taken I think all the questions that we're going to be uh, collecting today. But I just want to remind people to uh, please contact Susan or Anurag. Uh, I posted their email addresses; they allowed me to do that. <laughs> and um, uh, look out for registration information about uh, the next webinar in May, uh, tr Cybersecurity Research Transition to Practice. Um, Anurag, I want to thank you so much. And Susan, unfortunately, had to drop off. Um, but I wanted to thank both of you so much for uh, giving this presentation and taking these questions. Um, this seems like a very uh, somewhat intimidating topic. And so we appreciate people like you helping to explain it to the public. Yeah, I'm quite happy to do this. Also, I should mention that uh, uh, I, we do have our templates, documentation templates, available for anyone to use. I created multiple versions of them, so there is a version for people who are not at IU. Uh, so if you're interested, just oh. email me and I can provide that. That's great. And uh, also, for those of you who are watching, uh, we will be archiving this presentation. So uh, when that, the, uh, if you check back in on our website, uh, you'll be able to share it with your friends. And we're also uh, posting this video on YouTube. So uh, with that, I, I just want to thank you, Anurag, one last time. And um, I will be ending the meeting shortly. <laughs>